Due to the coronavirus spread and the lockdown of the countries, in the past few weeks we've seen everywhere on the internet pictures of animals getting closer to the cities. Videos show a group of dolphins swimming and playing in the harbour of the main city of Sardinia in Italy. This other video shows a herd of goats in a town in Wales, Great Britain. It usually comes down to the town only with very bad weather, and it usually stays in the back alleys. But during the lockdown, it strolled around the whole town with people enjoying the show through their windows. Similar cases have been seen all over the world. Wild boars in Haifa, Israel. Pink flamingos flourishing in Albania. A huge group of dugongs in Thailand, vulnerable marine species suffering water pollution. The type of message that these news are spreading is that nature is flourishing again thanks to the humans stepping back. The nature flourishing again thanks to humankind stepping back because in lockdown. Now, if I have to represent this kind of message with an image, a diagram, a drawing, it would be something like this. Now, many of you maybe will find nothing strange with this representation, especially the ones living in highly urbanized areas. But the truth is that this is a dangerous and biologically very misleading representation of the reality, because it implies that humans are aliens to the ecosystem they live in. Quick recap if anyone needs it. An ecosystem is the complex of living organisms, their physical environment and all their interrelationships in a unit of space. Unit of space, living organisms, physical environment and their interrelationships. So if we take as an example the harbour of a usually very busy city like Istanbul, the ecosystem of the harbour in this case is not paid just by the fishes, the algae and the sea. The humans are part of the space too, those humans who interact with these places and organisms, people who work there or people who live nearby, and also the infrastructures are part of the physical environment too, as much as the water of the sea is. Us humans cannot abstract from the ecosystem we live in. The bad bacteria that make us sick to the good bacteria that make us alive, from the dolphins that we love to the mosquitoes that we hate, to the fishes we go fish in open sea to the mussels that grow on the concrete of the piers in our cities. Wherever we live, we are part of ecosystems, whether we like it or not. And in anything we do, we cannot prescind from the interrelationships that we have with the other elements of the ecosystem. The environmental message that is spreading in these weeks of lockdown is somehow dangerous and misleading. Look at how beautiful the nature is without us. We should be the species who get extinct. This message does nothing else but deprive humans of their responsibility towards how they behave in the ecosystem they live in. It takes away the importance of environmental work and it characterizes the environmental practices as extremists. In fact, unfortunately, we are hearing more and more of the word ecofascism. So in the end, is the green turn of the Covid crisis a pure myth? The question is, is the current crisis doing good or bad to the environment? Well, let's take a look at some big numbers. Carbon Brief reported that in February-March 2020, China has reduced its CO2 emissions by 25% compared to the same time period in 2019. I also linked to an article below that shows how this decrease in emissions might have avoided about 50,000 deaths caused by air pollution, which is more than the deaths that happened for COVID-19 in the same period of time. Good news, right? We don't even need to look at the numbers. We can see in our cities how the air is cleaner, the water is cleaner too. We just feel that the pollution went down. That probably makes us happy, right? In the first weeks of the lockdown, we were all very happy to hear about this news. But are the perspectives for the next future as happy as the current situation? 
After we've enjoyed the beauty of this temporary drop in pollution, it's time to get back to our critical thinking position and start to analyze the situation a bit deeper. This map has become famous. It shows nitrogen dioxide emissions in China before and after the COVID outbreak. As always though, adopting a wider point of view allows us to have a deeper perspective on things. Let's widen our point of view then by looking at what happened to the emissions during the past economic crisis. Well, we can see that to every previous economic crisis corresponds a lower or negative growth of emissions, but eventually they keep growing. The oil crisis in the 70s and 80s, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the global financial crisis of 2008. They did nothing but delaying the emissions growth a few years. And why does this happen? Because the quantity of emissions doesn't only depend on the economic growth itself, it also depends on the intensity of the emissions, meaning the quantity of greenhouse gases released per unit of goods produced. If in normal times the intensity of emissions tends to decrease thanks to the technological advancements that happen during the years, during an economic crisis, governments and companies are less likely to invest in technological advancements and are more likely to go back to traditional and more polluting productive processes. So during an economic crisis, less resources and the need for quick profit favor traditional ways, machinery and methods of production, which causes the increment of the intensity of emissions. Now, I do realize that I'm giving you a whole lot of negative news right now. Who follows this channel knows perfectly that I always give both sides of each story, the good one and the bad one. But in the end, it's very important for me to focus on the positive outcome. So enough with the bad news. Now, let me give you the good news about how the pandemic might affect the climate change. First of all, the COVID crisis, like any crisis, brings pain and grief, but it also offered the greatest opportunities for radical changes. Quoting Glenn Peters, there is an opportunity to invest the stimulus money in structural changes leading to reduced emissions after economic growth returns, such as further development of clean technologies. This opportunity we've encountered already several times during the past decades, in the other economic crisis. So why should the change happen now if it hasn't happened before? Well, first of all, I want to discourage anyone thinking that there is the need for a colossal, gigantic change. I know we do need that, of course, but no human can climb the Mount Everest thinking about arriving to the peak directly. Climate change is such a huge and overwhelming problem that I think we really need as individuals to think by little, little steps at the time and not at the whole problem in once. Otherwise, we just get discouraged and we end up thinking that only governments can do something. We individuals can have no power of doing anything. So any type of change in favor of a greener economy is what we should strive for. Secondly, let me tell you in what regards I think that this crisis is different than the ones we've experienced before and might give us a chance for a real concrete change. I think this economical crisis might be different than the previous ones in two regards. I'm only 30, but I've been environmentally conscious and very sensitive since I was eight. I am attentive to this matter today as much as I was 5, 10, 20, 22 years ago. And I must say that I really witnessed to a gradual change in the sensitivity of the world around me about environmental issues. In particular, in the past two, three, five, seven years, I really perceived the awareness growing and growing around me. Look, people have been talking about the greenhouse effect since the 70s. And yet look how the emissions kept increasing since then. Look at how steep is this line between 2002 and 2008. But only in the past few years, we've had real trends about environmental protection. Think about veganism, zero waste movements, plastic bag bans and zero plastic campaigns. Think about the popularity of organic food or even the ban of plastic straws. 
What's important here is not whether these trends are going to be effective or not regarding their goals. Trends are stupid by definition, and I'm the first opponent to trends. What's important about this case, though, is that the simple fact that there are trends, like mass trends, connected to the protection of the environment shows that the awareness for environmental issues has spread widely. For the first time in the history of the ecological movement, there are masses, masses of people who know the problems. And there are also very high numbers that show that they care enough to change their personal habits in order to try to make a difference. And finally, since 2008, Greta Thunberg has been simply an amazing frosting on the cake. Along with the environmental problems, since the 70s, the environmental movements have increased, but I've never seen such a rapid and meaningful growth in the awareness and interest that I've seen in these past few years. And please, environmentalists that are older than me or more informed than me, let us know in the comments if this is true or not, because I might be wrong. But if this recent switch is real and it's not only an illusion, we can have big hopes for this crisis to be different than the previous ones. Aside of that, there are also more concrete reasons for this crisis to be a significant positive change for the environment. The coronavirus has forced all societies to get acquainted with working from home habits. Many companies are realizing that this system can be very convenient in terms of expenses for office spaces. Workers are slowly getting used to the difficult task of working from home. In this situation, many companies, even after the lockdown, will give the possibility to keep working from home. And many employees are going to take that chance. This will decrease the emissions caused by commuting and probably will decrease some emissions connected with the maintenance and the heating of office spaces. Similarly, the new online meeting habits forced by the pandemic will reduce the need for constant business flights, which is a relieving perspective, especially since the frightening growth of airline traffic in the past few years, which is, as we all know, extremely polluting for the air. This raises the prospect of long-term emissions reductions should these new war behaviors persist beyond the current global emergency. And this was an international expert speaking, not me. There is something to keep in mind, though. These are triggers. These are factors of influence of the change. But who has the last word on this process? Who will actually decide if we are going to take this incredible chance or not? According to Fatih Birol, executive director of International Energy Agency, Governments directly or indirectly drive more than 70% of global energy investments. So it is obvious that the governments are the ones who control the market and who have the power to make it take a direction or the other. They have a fundamental role in the regulation of energy investments. Governments are the entities that will ultimately decide if the coronavirus crisis is going to turn into a historical chance for the health of this planet, or if the economies are going to quickly go back to destroy the ecosystems we are part of. Because the governments are charged with such a huge responsibility, the next episode of this series is going to be entirely dedicated to see and analyze what governments are doing or not in this delicate moment. Hi, I am Mary Jane, an Italian currently quarantined in New York City. This is the first time I openly talk about environmental problems on my channel, even if this topic is the one that concerns me the most about the life on this planet. And it is, in my opinion, the most important one we should discuss about. I yet have to understand what direction my travel channel now is gonna take, but for the moment I can tell you that this mini-series about how the Covid is going to affect the climate change consists of three videos, of this one is only the first one. 
So please don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you think it's worth following and especially click the bell button because only subscribing to a channel these days unfortunately doesn't do much for its visibility. Thank you for watching and please look forward to the next video I'm gonna make on this topic because it is strictly connected to this one, it's like a second part and at the end of that one I'm gonna make a very important call to action, a call to action that regards things that I talked about today. So if you watch this video till this very end and it stimulated you, it is very, very important that you come back for the part two, which is the next one. Bye.